Um, hello everyone, I'm Hoda Abu Khadra, an analytics DevOps engineer working with Scotiabank, to be specific, the MLOps team at Scotiabank in Toronto. And I'm also a certified Google Cloud Platform professional architect. Uh, so excited to join you today and share with you some of my MLOps experience in GCP. Uh, so generally, this session is optimum for data scientists and ML engineers uh, who want to apply DevOps to principle into ML systems. That means practicing automation, monitoring, testing, releasing, deployment, and infrastructure management. So let's get started. So first, let's have a look into um, our agenda. Um, so I will be starting with the MLOps lifecycle. We will talk about the different processes or phases in the MLOps lifecycle. Then we will move to the MLOps end-to-end um, -end workflow. Um, so we will discuss more about what the, ML, uh, the MLOps workflow looks like, um, what each step entails. And after that, we will be discussing specific tools or products in GCP that maps with um, with, with each step or each, uh, each, each, each process in, in, in that workflow. After that, we will be moving to the best of practices. So I gather some of uh, the most important best of practices for GCP related to ML and ML ops. And we'll be finishing our session with the references and suggested readings. And obviously, a couple of minutes if you have any questions to ask. Okay, so let's start with the MLOps lifecycle. So if we looked into the diagram, we will see that the MLOps lifecycle consists of uh, six different uh, processes or stages. It starts with ML development and ends with continuous monitoring. Uh, to have a brief overview in which uh, what each um, process entails, we can start with the ML development, uh, which is about experimenting and developing a robust model training procedure, which consists of multiple tasks from data preparation and transformation to model training and evaluation. After the ML development process completed, we will be moved to training operation, operationalization, which, which is focusing on automating the process of packaging, testing, and deploying repeatable and reliable training pipelines. After the training operationalization, we will move to the continuous training, which is mostly concerns about repeatedly executing the training pipeline in response to new data, code changes, or even scheduling, uh, potentially with new training settings. Moving to the model deployment, which is about packaging, testing, deploying a model to a serving environment, for online experimentation and production serving. After the model deployment, we have prediction serving, which is mainly about serving that model that's deployed into production, finishing up with the continuous monitoring, which is about monitoring the effectiveness and efficiency of a deployed model. So this is like high level explanation for each different stage in our MLOps lifecycle. In the next slide, we'll be discussing more what an end-to-end -end workflow looks like in MLOps. So let's have a look. So this is what a typical end-to-end -end workflow in MLOps looks like. Um, Although it looks like waterfall workflow, it's it's not it's not as it is. Um, we can see that uh, so sometimes you have to pass um, all the processes, but sometimes also you don't have to. Sometimes you will skip some processes uh, or specific flow um, to achieve your your goal for the whole workflow. So it's a pretty much flexible. If we are back to ML development, uh, we can say that the core activity during this phase is experimentation. Uh, 
So data scientists or ML engineers will prototype modern architectures and training routines. They will also create labeled data sets and they use features and other usable ML artifacts that are governed through data and model management process. So the primary output for this process is a formalized training procedure, which includes data pre-processing, model architecture, and model training settings. If this ML system requires continuous training, um, we will be looking into um, op operationalizing the training pipeline, um, which requires continuous integration, continuous delivery room routine to build, test, and deploy the pipeline to the target execution environment. After this, we have uh, the continuous training pipe. After the continuous training pipeline is executed, repeatedly based on specific triggers and produce a model as an output, the model is returned as a new data becomes available or if model performance issues are detected. Other training artifacts and metadata that are produced by a training pipeline are also tracked. So if the pipeline produces a successful model candidate, that a candidate is then tracked by the model management process as a registered model. The registered model is reviewed, approved for release, and then deployed to a production environment. The deployed model serves productions using the deployment pattern that you have specified. It could be online, batch, or streaming productions. In addition to serving productions, the serving runtime can generate model explanations and capture serving logs to be used by the continuous monitoring process. Finishing with the continuous monitoring process, which monitors the model itself for productive effectiveness and service. So the primary goal is to uh, of effective performance is monitoring is detecting model issues, like for example, data drift or concept drift. The model deployment can also be monitored for efficiency metrics like latency or execution errors. Now we had an overview for an end-to-end -end workflow for MLOps process. We can look into what are the products that GCP is providing to match or map each of those uh, stages. So I have gathered some of the products. So those products are the recommended products by GCP, but it's important also to mention that it's not limited to. Like, uh, for example, based on your use case, based on your corporate needs, you will need to to choose some of those products. However, for example, from my professional experience, um, we have used uh, other products that are not listed here and I will get more in details into that. So uh, before diving into ML development, we need also to discuss what kind of ML environment setup we need, right? Uh, for the environment setup, Mainly, it would be Vertex AI Workbench Notebooks, Interactive Notebooks, or User Managed Notebooks instance, which offers an integrated and secure Jupyter Lab environment for data scientists, machine learning developers to experiment, develop, and deploy models into production. The User Managed Notebooks instances come pre-installed with the latest data science and machine learning frameworks. Um, and we will have a deeper look into those frameworks like TensorFlow, PyTorch, XGBoost, for example, and Scikit-Learn, of course. Um, beside having the notebooks or the user-managed notebooks, we also have uh, Vertex AI SDK for Python. So generally, Vertex AI provides client libraries for different programming languages. Um, this could be Java, Node the GS or uh, Python, but for ML related work, we are mostly concerned about Python. Um, after Vertex AI SDK for Python or Python libraries and Vertex AI, uh, we have Terraform. Uh, Terraform is an infrastructure as code tool that lets you 
build change in version code and on uh, version cloud and uh, on-prem resources safely and efficiently. So you use Terraform uh, to, to set up your infrastructure. Um, after you have your environment set up ready, you got your notebooks ready and your resources are deployed, uh, you can start into the next phase, which is uh, the ML development itself. So you will see about uh, 11 different tools and products in this table. Um, however, I will be discussing in details the most like popular ones for, for ML and GCP. Um, and those will be uh, BigQuery, BigQuery ML, AutoML, and Cloud Storage. Um, for Vertex AI, you will see multiple other tools for ML development, like um, data labeling, explainable AI, AI feature store, um, TensorBoard, training experiments. Um, however, because we have limited time, we will not discuss it in details. Um, I have referenced all of them in the reference from the official documentation. So if you are interested in learning more about them, uh, feel free to, reach, to, to check them out. Okay, so let's just start with BigQuery. I think everyone hears about GCP and ML. The first couple of products that come in, that come in your mind are BigQuery, Vertex AI, Cloud Storage, uh, sometimes Dataflow, um, TensorFlow for sure. Uh, so BigQuery is the most popular one. Uh, it's mainly for st structured and semi-structured data. So it's a Google Cloud fully managed petabyte scale and cost-effective analytics data warehouse that lets you run analytics over vast amount of data in near real time. So with BigQuery, there is no infrastructures to worry about or to set up, manage. So it lets you focus on finding meaningful inside using Google SQL and taking advantage of flexible pricing models across on-demand and flat rate options. So what I really like about BigQuery is you pay for only what you use. Even in the UI before running a query, it tells you how much this query will cost. So it tells you more if you are planning to optimize your queries. Um, it, it tells you lots of information even before running the queries, which is I really like. I've been using it for a couple of hours, a couple of years now, and uh, highly recommended for structured or semi-structured data. After BigQuery, we have BigQuery ML. Um, so BigQuery ML lets you create and execute machine learning models using Google um, Google SQL queries. BigQuery ML uh, also lets SQL practitioners build models using existing SQL tools and skills. Uh, it increased the development speed by eliminating the need to move data, which is awesome. Um, for AutoML, it's, it, it mainly enables you to build code-free model based on training data you provide. So those types of models you can build depends on the type of data you have. Um, Vertex AI generally offers AutoML solutions for different data types or um, and model objectives. So it supports image data, video data, text data, and tabular data. And then we'll move to cloud storage. So cloud storage is a service, it's buckets, like in a separate way, it's buckets in GCP. So it's a service to store your objects in Google Cloud. So an object is mutable piece of data consisting of a file of any format. Like it could be like Avro format, could be CSV, or even TensorFlow records in general. Uh, so you can store those objects in containers called buckets, and all buckets are as associated with a project. Um, talking about Vertex AI data labeling uh, or, and the rest of Vertex AI tools for ML development, uh, those are referenced in details in the last page of this presentation. 
So feel free to check them out. After we discussed the, um, the ML environment setup and also the ML development phase, we are looking into data processing now. For data processing, we have also some popular tools that I will be uh, explaining more in details than others, depends on their uh, popular popularity. Uh, so for example, we have BigQuery, I just covered BigQuery, so that's okay. We can go ahead and talk about Dataflow, Dataproc, um, and Dataplex. And Dataplex, from my personal experience, are the least popular from the use cases I have seen so far. So I will go over Dataflow and Dataproc in more details. Uh, for data Flow, um, it's generally managed service for executing wide variety of data processing patterns uh, using Apache Beam SDK, which is an open source programming model that enables you to develop both batch and streaming pipelines. Uh, you can also create your pipeline with an Apache Beam program and then run them on the data flow service. Uh, for data proc, it's using Apache Spark who doesn't know Apache Spark, right? <laughs> so data proc is a managed Apache Spark and Apache Hadoop service that lets you take advantage of open source data tools for batch processing, querying, and streaming, um, and machine learning. <laughs> so data proc automation helps you create clusters quickly manage them easily and save money by turning clusters off when you don't need them. So it saves you money. Um, Dataplex is also referenced in, in, the, in the reference page at the end of the slides. Um, so we can move to the operationalized training. For the operationalized training, we have the top four popular frameworks in ML, um, which are PyTorch, TensorFlow, XGPoot, Scikit-Learn, um, all of them are great. Generally, when we talk about GCP, it's highly recommend to use TensorFlow. It's not limited to TensorFlow, but if you, if you are looking to get uh, like the most out of the experience for developing ML uh, workflows in GCP, you need to be friend with TensorFlow. There are also other tools and products that uh, can be used for this process, and they are Feature Store, Vertex AI Feature Store, uh, Pipelines Training, and Mode Evaluation. But most of the work that I have done so far, and I've seen other teams are doing in my um, in my professional environment, are are using mostly the top uh, four uh, frameworks that we just discussed. Okay, now we completed the operationalized training. Let's have a look into the next process. Um, we have model deployment and serving. We have ML workflow orchestration, artifact organization, and also model monitoring. So worth mentioning again, that those are just recommended tools by GCP. Um, official documentation. However, the platform can use um, others. Like, for example, for orchestration, you can use um, Apache Airflow uh, and DAGs, which I believe are very popular too. For data processing and, and feature engineering, you can also include uh, other tools like DBT, for example. I'm just I'm just mentioning here like what is recommended by G GCP, but just to let you know that it's not limited to those tools and products in general in real life. Uh, so for model deployment and serving, we have some tools connected with um, Vertex AI, like production, feature store, matching engine, um, others like streaming ingestion, custom production routines, VM co-hosting, TensorFlow Enterprise. For ML workflow orchestration, uh, there, there is Vertex AI pipelines. You can add to that um, uh, Apache Airflow or Kubeflow as well. Artifact organization, we have Vertex ML metadata, Vertex AI model registry, 
And for model monitoring, we have explainable AI and model monitoring. So those tables are to let you know what kind of products provided by GCP that you can map for each step we covered in the end-to-end -end workflow. Uh, of course, some of the Vertex AI uh, tools are um, overlapping in, in multiple in multiple steps. I, and I think that's, this is a good thing. Uh, if one tool can do multiple steps in the workflow, like why not, right? Um, next, we will be looking into GCP best of practices. And those are not all the best of practices, but I gathered some important points that I found relatable to my professional experience. So I feel that they are important to know. So let's get started. Uh, first, using Vertex AI Workbench Notebook for experimentation and development. Uh, so it's recommended generally that you use Vertex AI Workbench Notebooks for experimentation and development. Um, this includes uh, writing code, starting jobs, running queries, and checking status. Uh, notebook instances let you access all of Google Cloud data and AI services in a simple way. And this means like I, I'm able, for example, to call BigQuery data set from my, um, my notebook, right? I can create data, drops data. I can move data from BigQuery data set, transform it to um, a CSV file in cloud storage, for example, and vice versa. So Vertex AI workbench notebooks are really powerful. Um, that's a good practice to use them because that's the whole point, right? <laughs> um, creating notebook instance for each team member. Um, it's encouraged that you have specific notebook or a separate notebook peer per team member, also per project because projects could be different when it comes to dependencies and data access, especially if you are working and uh, with like sensitive um, information, uh, like if you are working in a bank or a hospital or like healthcare, um, the data that you are using, you need to make sure you are not like, yeah, you are not mixing stuff up, right? Uh, so it's recommended that you have a specific notebook for each person. However, you can also set um, a generic, like if you want to collaborate with your team members on a specific notebook, uh, you can add the access to a service account level. But with service account level, you can give access to all your team member who have the same permission to the, that specific project. So they can all work on the same notebook. But it's not recommended to leave all your notebooks at the service account permission. Um, but it's an option that's it, it's there if you want. Uh, storing ML resources or artifact based on your corporate policy. So the simplest access control is to store both your row and vertex AI resources and artifacts such as data sets and models in the same Google Cloud project. You can configure your, cor your corporate cross-project access control with identi identity and access management or IAM in, in the console. Um, it's also recommended if you are using structured and semi-structured data to store them in the query um, because you can store intermediate process data in BigQuery as well. So uh, it allows you maximum speed. It's better to store materialized data instead of using views or subqueries for training data. For storing unstructured data like images or videos, audio, uh, it's recommended to use cloud storage um, because it allows you to store them in large container formats. It, uh, it applies to TensorFlow um, records files or Avro files if you are using other frameworks. You can also combine many individual images, videos, or audio clips into large files. So this will improve your read and write throughput to cloud storage. Uh, you can also maximize your model productive accuracy with hyperparameter tuning. 
um, because hyperparameter tuning removes the need to manually adjust hyperparameters over the course of numerous training um, runs to arrive at the optimal values. And last point in this page would be, or slide, would be using feature attributions to gain insights into model predictions. So offering feature attributions to provide insights into why models generate predictions, vertex, vertex explainable AI helps you better understand your model behavior and supports uh, custom trained models based on tabular and image data. Okay, moving to the last slides of content we have today, which is the second page of the GCP best of practices. Um, we will start with using data flow to process data. So with large volumes of data, consider using data flow, which use Apache B programming model. Um, you can use data flow to convert the unstructured data into binary data formats like TensorFlow record, uh, which can improve performance of data ingestion during the training process. Also using training checkpoints will save the current state of your experiment. So if you are not training interactively, if you once your model fails, um, it's not and is not it is not checkpoint. The training job will finish and the data will be lost because the model isn't in the memory. To prevent this scenario, make it a practice to always use training checkpoints to ensure you don't lose state. We also recommend that you save those checkpoints in cloud storage. Next, we'll be specifying the number and types of machine you need. So you need to be aware of the difference of machine types for your notebook. Um, does it need like uh, a specific amount of CPU? Does it need GPU instead of CPU? Um, there are, yeah, there are a variety of the machine types. So depends on uh, what type of data, the amount of data that you are processing. Make sure to use the appropriate um, hardware for your model. Uh, also turning on automatic scaling. Uh, so if you are, if you use the online production service, in most cases, it's recommended that you turn on automatic scaling by setting the minimum and the maximum nodes. Um, you can set automatic scaling with a minimum of two nodes. And this also applies to Composer, which is the tool in GCP for um, for Apache Airflow, uh, it allows you, Composer version 2 allows uh, automatic scaling, which, which is awesome. Um, after that, we have using Vertex AI pipelines to orchestrate the ML workflow. So you can use, while well, you can manually trigger each data process, training, evaluation, test, and deployment. The whole point is to automate those uh, processes, right? So it's recommended that you use Vertex AI pipelines for orchestration. Um, it also supports DAGs uh, generated by Kubeflow, TensorFlow, Extended, and Airflow. Uh, you can also use a source control repository for pipeline definitions and training code. Um, so you can use uh, them to, to, and to you can use source control to version control your ML pipelines and the custom components you built for those pipelines. Uh, using Artifact Registry to use um, store, manage, and security Docker container images without making them publicly visible is highly recommended. And last point would be using feature attributions to detect a data draft. So you can use it with Vertex Explainable AI to, de to detect uh, data draft. Uh, feature attributions also help you detect any degradation in model performance. And by this, we'll be done with our main content. Uh, in the next slide, I'm listing all the official documentation references I have used to create this presentation. Um, so feel free to check them out. And lastly, um, if you have any feedback, suggestions for what was covered today, feel free to reach out uh, and let me know what, you're, what you think. And thank you so much for attending the session.